Share with us, brother. Amen. Appreciate that. Um, most of you probably don't know me. I actually, I first met Jerry uh, not too long after I got born again. I actually ran into him at the Sunflower Health Food Store. <laughs> and uh, I still had my long hair, my earrings, and all that. And I just shared a little bit of my testimony, and actually he invited me up to give a short testimony back then. So it's been uh, almost, uh, except for when I was here last uh, month there with Doug, uh, it's been almost 20 years since I haven't been here. Long time. So, uh, so I've been saved for, uh, actually it's been about uh, late summer 1993, 94 I got born again. But anyhow, on my way here and even last night, you know, uh, one thing I learned about my, my, trip, my trip to Africa last year was uh, not to premeditate what to teach or preach. Uh, what you need to do is you need to fill yourself up with the Word and fill yourself up with the Lord and praying in tongues and all that and let Him bring the message. And So of course I'm going to share most of, use most of my time to share my testimony. Um, but um, you know, I was saying, Lord, there's just so many different ways I can go in sharing the things that He's taught me since 2007, which was a huge year for me. And then uh, Jerry mentioned the word transformation, and then the brother back there mentioned doubt and unbelief, which stops the work of God. And then this last song here that we praise, Be More Like Jesus, well I said that's my message right there. I, I got my confirmation of what I need to share on at the last part of my testimony, because that's what God began to teach me in 2007, that faith puts God to work, and unbelief stops God from working. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to touch on, I like to teach, I, I love to teach on that for a whole half hour. Because it's brought so much change to my life. It actually brought me to Africa and Europe last year. So anyhow, uh, my name is Pierre Roussel, I'm French. Um, I'm bilingual, fluent, bilingual French and English. I was born French. I was born in uh, Vernon, Ontario. That's a little place uh, about half an hour past Sturgeon Falls, north. Sturgeon Falls is about an hour past North Bay, so... You go North Bay, Sturgeon Falls, Werner, then an hour past that, you get Sudbury. That's where I was born. I was born actually in Sturgeon Falls the Hospital. We lived in, North, in Werner for three years, then we moved here to Oshawa because my dad worked in the General Motors. So raised in a, raised in a French home, raised Catholic, uh, but not uh, staunch Catholics, uh, but just basically went to church every, every Sunday to the Catholic Church here in Oshawa, the French uh, Catholic Church. I went to Carpus Christi. And... Um, so basically lived a normal life as a little boy, uh, got into the sports and things like that, and uh, had a good family life overall. Dad took us out to, uh, to uh, summer vacations, we went and did a lot of camping, Vancouver and Florida and things like that. And uh, sports a little bit, things like that, playing around with the neighbors, playing cowboys and Indians, a little boy and all that. But uh, something dramatic happened in my life. Um, from grade 8 and grade 9, which happens, I've, I've been researching this for quite a few years, it happens with a lot of teens, and just to let you know, up to grade 8, my, basically my grades were, I mean, I don't think I had A pluses, but A minuses, B pluses, things like that. And actually, my mom ran into one of my school teachers just a few years ago, she was a nun, because they had a lot of nuns at Corpus Christi back then, and uh, she mentioned how, you know, she asked how's Pierre doing, and she, she gave her my testimony a little bit before I got saved. And she goes, I can't believe that, because the thing I remember about Pierre was, and she taught me a grade six, uh, and uh, she said, the thing I remember about Pierre was, on Fridays, he was asking me all the time, could I come to school on Saturday? Mm -hmm. So, but I share that, because I ended up getting kicked out of four high schools, mm -hmm. uh, because of the drugs. And uh, that's what happened. In grade 8, the summer of grade 8, somehow the enemy moved into my life. And I didn't have enough of whatever it took to withstand that. Because I had a lot of friends that had, were introduced to the drugs. And they actually said no to it. And they weren't born again. And I wasn't certainly not born again back then. But I, I still remember the day that I was introduced to, to pot. And I still remember the day that I was introduced to drinking beer. And like I said, it was a summer... Uh, before I went to uh, Etienne Lillet, which is a high school, French high school in Toronto, and uh, I got hooked. The first time I smoked two joints, I could mention the guy's name, I won't, you guys don't know him, but I just want to mention names. And the guy who introduced me to the, to the drinking, I still remember where, I still remember when. And I got totally hooked for 16 years. And I mean, it just got so bad, like I said, I got kicked out of four high schools, 
And I'm going to I'm going to try to go through my testimony real quick so I can get into the space stuff and this transformation to his image. Um, I got kicked out of four high schools twice in the Temple of Day. They gave me a contract. I signed a contract to let me back in. Within two months, they kicked me back out again for skipping classes, for bringing drugs into the school, for getting drunk in school, stuff like that. Being sick in the school in the class because of being drunk. I'm drinking straight vodka in, in school. Oh I had serious problems. And, uh, and then I went to McLaughlin after that. I got two credits that year. Actually, they gave me one. They, 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 they tried to give me one credit, but uh, my French, I took a French class, and uh, Mrs. Grabowski, she tried to fail me because I caused her so many problems because I was stoned all the time. So I went to the principal and I said, listen, I said, you can't fail me because I'm fluent French. So they gave me my two credits, they said, we don't want you back here. So that was that my, that really that's my third school in a way, that's my second school, the third time I got kicked out. Then I went to O'Neill the next year, and within two months I got kicked out. Because I was skipping class all the time because I was just getting stoned in the morning and that's all I wanted to do. So eventually I went to Central and uh, I finally graduated. And then after that I was getting involved in the music and things like that. I got into the construction which is not a good environment for drugs. And uh, for, so after that, for all those years until 31, I got heavily involved in partying to the place where I was getting drunk three nights a week. I mean getting drunk. Um, the last three years before I got born again, I was getting so drunk, it was ridiculous. But at the same time, and of course the whole thing, promiscuity and all that, I don't want to get into that. It was really bad. I got venereal diseases because of it, things like that. And, uh, but what happened was I got really heavily involved in the music. And I, I'm going to get into this right now because that's really what God used to get me born again. And uh, my, I had some cousins, I skip a lot of stuff here because I really want to move into the space stuff. And um, I had some cousins who were Catholic and I really hadn't kept in touch with them in years because they were Catholic and I was atheist basically. And uh, I want nothing to do with religion, all that. But uh, what happened is this summer they invited me out to a baseball tournament. And of course I was a big drunk and they all were getting drunk too. And um, we won't go there. But, uh, so I went out there and I was already doing some recording here in Oshawa. I was playing in a little band called Nitrix. Uh, they had already made an EP and uh, they had disbanded. But anyhow, I got to meet some of the, uh, the players. We, we put the, they put the group back together. I became one of the guitar players. And uh, so that didn't work out the best because we're all drinking. But what happened is I moved, I, I went up to Werner for a weekend because my cousins invited me to go up there to play ball, baseball. And I had some tapes we had made out here on 8-track real, uh, reel-to-reel players and stuff like that with some friends. And a lot of these guys that work at Long McQuaid in Oshawa. And um, so I started playing some of my tapes and they're going, who's this? And they're going, oh, that's what I'm doing, you know. And they were playing a lot with the, they were doing a lot of outreach with the youth in Quebec. And they were originally from uh, Sudbury, from Field, actually, not too far from Werner, but they had moved to Sudbury, but eventually they moved to, to Drummondville, Quebec. So I'm up there this, that weekend playing baseball, playing my tapes and stuff like that. And they said, you know what, we could really use, we could really use your music to beef up our music to reach out to the kids. So, I, so we got talking a little bit and went home that weekend on the Sunday, and then me and my cousin, he's my age, his name is Angelo, he's a guitar player, and he does a lot of work with the youth, now he's in Cochrane actually, Cochrane, Ontario. And uh, we started communicating over the phone, and he said, let me send you one of our tapes and see if you could do something with it, to beef it up. So I, they sent me the tape and all that, I started listening to it, and so what we did, we, I ended up going out there for a weekend, spent a, a weekend with them, where they're recording, where they're playing, stuff like that. And to my, well, they had warned me a little bit beforehand, but when I went there, it's a, it was a huge retreat house for retired nuns, priests. I never seen so many crucifixes. I never seen so many statues in my life. And uh, so we got into the music thing a little bit. I brought my guitar up there. And I remember we were in the wash and me and my dad were sitting there. And he says, you want to stay another day? I said, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> because of all the religion. But, uh, so anyhow, we left, and, uh, but we kept in contact. And this was in 1990, 
where the recession hit, and I wasn't doing a lot of work at the time. I was working construction, been in construction for years, uh, installing drywall, framing, and things like that. Worked in the union, worked in high rises and things like that, houses. And uh, I was desperate for change. And I was, like I said, I was getting drunk three nights a week. And I mean drunk and uh, smoking dope and all that and carousing and bar hopping and the music. And there was a part of me that I wanted to get free. But I didn't know how to get free and I didn't really seek help because once you get over your hangover, you know, when you're, you're, you're doing your, your, your hangover thing, you know, oh my God, oh my God, I'll never drink again, I'll never drink again. And then once you get over the hangover, you're back drinking again. So I lived like that for years. But, uh, and God was not in the picture at all. I mean, my mom was really preaching at me. She was pretty Catholic, but she was charismatic though. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Um, she actually got born again in the Catholic Church. And she actually got her tongues in the Catholic Church. Um, yeah. So anyhow, so I remember out of desperation in my, in my townhouse, I just did the Lord's Prayer. That's all I knew. But I, I know I didn't mean it. I don't, I don't think I meant it because I had no intent in following God. I, didn't know, I had no interest in God. Um, I had stopped going to the Catholic Church when I got into the drugs. My parents said, we're not going to force them to go to church and stuff like that. So I remember I prayed that prayer, just being honest. And uh, so eventually I took up their, their offer. I moved out to Quebec, to Drummondville, Quebec, to uh, play music. And that was my sole intent was to play music. I had started practicing a whole lot more because of the, the recession. I was practicing like eight, ten hours a day. My playing just went right up. Um, I was listening to some of the greatest guitar players in the world. My playing was getting good. I was, I was working on my songs, my melodies. I learned how to play keyboard to write my melodies on it. And I had a lot of guitars. I had about 12 or 13 guitars. I spent all my money on that. All my money on, on the drugs and all that. And so I moved up there and I started rehearsing with them. I started getting accustomed to their songs and started uh, reshaping their songs and all that. And uh, started playing with the youth, going out with the youth. And uh, we traveled to Quebec, we traveled to Southern Ontario, we traveled Northern Ontario, which was a great experience. I started to give my testimony, not the testimony about being born again, but I just started sharing my testimony with the kids. Because a lot of the kids that were playing in front, they'd see, and I have, my, my hair was down here, I got some of my pictures on my YouTube videos. And uh, I had the earrings and all that, and a lot of my cousins were giving their testimony, not about drugs or anything like that. And they'd always say, what about that guy? Doesn't he talk? So I remember one day, I, I, I don't know if it was God or what, but it had to be God. I felt like I had to share my testimony. So right there, I went up to the front and I said, I'm going to start talking. And I started sharing about the drugs and all that. And that really ministered to a lot of the kids. But I didn't know God. I had no... I remember I was in this one high school. It was a, a separate. All nuns. Most of them were nuns, anyhow. And I'm sharing my testimony, and I remember the school teacher at the back, and I remember her because she's a real cutie, and uh, she said, who set you free from the drugs? Well, I wasn't set free from the drugs yet. But she said, who set you free from the drugs? Christ? I said, I don't know. All I know is I got a, pray I got a mother who prays. That's all I said. That's all I knew at the time, you know? But I had no interest in God whatsoever. I had no interest in religion, going to church. I had no interest in it. I wanted to play music. I wanted to play music. I even started uh, chasing the girls in Drummondville. I started trying to... I was living with priests. And we're kind of outside of Drummondville. So for me to go to the bars, I didn't have a car. So I had to walk across the bridge. It was cold. It was winter time. It's really cold out there. It really wasn't working out for me. You know, I was the priest. Some of the priests were drinking, so I was able to drink a little bit with them, stuff like that. But uh, all I know is one Saturday, skipping a lot of stuff here because I want to get to this faith message because it's going to set us. It's it's setting me free from a lot of things. But uh, one Saturday afternoon, my cousins were. You know, one of my one of my cousins is. He's, there were three brothers. I mean, like, uh, blood brothers. And one of them was a brother in the Catholic Church, like a nun, you know, the opposite of uh, a brother. And uh, he had been a, a bush pilot, a missionary, to uh, Papua New, uh, New Guinea for, for 23 years or something like that. So he was basically our manager. And one of my cousins, Angelo, was a guitar player. I was the electric guitar player. I even did all the, the keyboards and the drums and all that. All I know 
is my cousins, they used to get up at 5 to go to Mass at the chapel downstairs. But me, I practiced till 4 o'clock in the morning. So one, one day, my cousin, uh, Gia, the oldest one, got on me and said, you know, you don't come to Mass with me, or with us. I said, well, it was never part of the deal. And my, my cousin actually stu stood up for me and said, listen, this guy just basically came off the streets. You know, and I appreciated that. I really did, because I had no intention of going to Mass or anything like that. But, uh, and of course, my cousins were going, man, you know, you're coming up with all these good parts for our songs and all that. What are you doing all this? I said, what do you think I do till 4 o'clock in the morning? I was actually practicing. They had to give me a nice room. I had my keyboards. I had my, my reel-to-reel -reel stuff like that. All my guitars. And I would work on my solos and the melodies to, to change their, their music and stuff like that to make it more uh, uh, appealing to the youth and all that. So they said, okay, we'll let you do what you got to do. You're here to play music. But, uh, see, I had a praying mother. And my mom... Um, at that time, she was still in the Catholic Church, but she had gotten born again. She doesn't know, she doesn't remember when she got born again, but she said she remembers listening to David Maines back when she was living up north, Ontario. And we're talking about years ago when David Maines just started going on television, uh, listening to Huntley Street. So she thinks she got born again around there. So all I know is she got her tongues in the parking lot of Esalton and Nukla Dam in Oshawa. That's where she got her tongues. And she had some friends that were charismatic. They were Catholic, and they prayed for her. She got the gift of tongues there. So she tells me this years later, after I got saved. And uh, so all I know is I had this experience. And looking back, of course, it's my mom had been praying for me for 15 years. And she came to a place where she couldn't pray for me. She was so discouraged by the things she was seeing me doing to myself, even while I was living at home. Like, on my 16th birthday, we had broken into a school the night before. We're a high... We had broken into uh, the shopping center, um, some, some records, we had stolen some records, and so the police were looking for these guys, and we were it. So we broke into the school, they caught one of the guys, he snitched on us, I come in at 4 o'clock in the morning, I lunch, I, I'm going to skip all that right now, but all I know is the police knocked on my parents' door on my birthday at 16 years old, they are SMPs, undercovers, and they walked right into my room with a handcuff, they said, you're pure, you sell, this and that, let, let us see your boots. Because what happened the night before, uh, we broke into Sunset Heights, which is Oshawa, and once the police showed up, we did, a, we did a beeline for the door. And it was all dark out, and I didn't know where I was going, I, didn't, I wasn't familiar with the school. All I know is I ran at the back of the school, and I hit a cliff, and I went about 40 feet down in the mud. And there's a creek at the bottom. I could have died that night, and I would have went to hell. Because there's rocks down there. So anyhow, I made my way back home. I got home full of mud. My boots are full of mud. So the police come in the next day. They see, can we see your boots? Well, they knew right away who I was. They've been chasing us all night. So all I know is that's, that began my, 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 my criminal life, whatever. I, I, had a, I needed to get a pardon eventually, stuff like that. So that, I, that brought a lot of hardship also to the family and to my family. You know, one thing I learned is that, you know, when you cause problems to yourself, you're not only causing problems to yourself, you're causing problems to everybody around you. Because when I remember my parents saying, what have we done to you for you to do this to us? And I said, what's your problem? I mean, what am I doing? If I'm doing anything, it's to me, not to you. Mm -hmm. That's how stupid I was. That's how ignorant I was. That's how full of pride I was. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I have a drink here. I'm, this Saturday, I'm in Drummondville, Practicing my guitar. <clears throat> no interest in God whatsoever. I'm just being very honest with you. One of the first dreams I've had from the Lord was within a couple months after I got born again. Uh, I had two visions. And then, of course, I got more visions later on. But one of them was I was on the 401. And I was in a little shower stall taking a shower. And it was nothing pornographic or anything like that. I, I didn't see my bottom. But I was naked. I was taking a shower in a little shower stall. And I remember the cars going back and forth in the traffic and the minute I woke up the word that came to me was transparency and I've been transparent ever since because I was not transparent before I got saved I was a hypocrite I was a liar I lied so much I had to lie, make up lies to get out of my lies but when I got born again God set me free from all that and God said be transparent with people your testimony your walk with me your struggles be transparent with people so anyhow here I am the Saturday afternoon I got, for some reason, I got a, a desire to go to the little chapel. 
So I went to the chapel that afternoon. It was a Saturday. I've been there for a few months. And uh, that was 1994, the end of the summer. And they were having a retreat. It was a retreat house and lots of rooms, like, like a hotel. And uh, they were having a retreat. And there's these three nuns from New Hampshire, which is not too far from Drummondville, just across the border. And this priest, Pai Al Hood. And they were at the front. And I didn't give any attention to them. I just went to the chapel and I sat at the back. And I remember I just sat there for a few minutes. I went back upstairs, got back on my guitar playing. And then I don't think it was much, very long, maybe a half hour later, I had a desire to go back to the chapel again. So I went back downstairs to the chapel. And here they are, the nuns, the three nuns and the priests are at the front. And uh, so it didn't, mean, it didn't mean nothing to me. So I went back upstairs. And then a third time... Um, it wasn't the Holy Spirit prompting me from the inside because I wasn't, I wasn't saved yet, but somehow he was moving on me. So I went downstairs. Of course, my mom was probably praying for me, and she had some friends praying for, for me, uh, charismatic Catholics. So, um, so I went down there, and I remember sitting by the organ, and uh, I remember the three nuns at the front with the priest, and they were actually sitting in the front, I remember, because Christ was on that side on the cross, and they had the Virgin Mary there. And this is where it gets a little controversial. I don't, I don't believe in what... I'm, I'm not for the Catholic Church or anything like that. I'm not against them, but I'm not... You know, this is where my, my testimony gets a little controversial. I've had people say, well, don't share that part. I say, that's my testimony for crying out loud. And one of the things I... I just looked it up last night. I, I'm big on word studies. I'm big on Greek and all that. But even the word testimony here means to, to be a witness. And also, it comes with the word martyr. But it actually has to testify, to give evidence, to bear record, a good, honest report, well, well reported affirmation. So that's what I'm doing. I can only share what, what happened to me. So, anyhow, there's these three nuns and there's a priest at the front. And I still remember this. They're on their knees and they're asking the Virgin Mary, forgive us for we are sinners. And I remember them doing this. So, all I know, I'm sitting back there. All of a sudden, I get this thought that would not go away. If they're sinners, how much more you? And I'll tell you, something happened there because they were done at that time after they were done their thing. One of the nuns walked right by me. I'm still sitting there. She says, are you okay, young man? I said, I must have had some kind of look on my face. I said, I don't know. She goes, you want to talk to the priest? I said, okay. All right. So I remember walking to the, came out of the chapel, and right around the corner was a little room. And the minute, I mean the minute I walked into that room, at that time I didn't know it, I got, I got so convinced, convicted, that I was a sinner. It came so strong on me, I began to see my drinking, I began to see my drugs, and the worst, well the worst part, it's all the same, but I mean the worst part, I began to see my fornication. I seen things that I had never seen before, yet the whole time it was all about me, that I was seeing. I didn't even talk to the priest. All I know is that I knew that heaven was real, but I knew that I wasn't going there. Yeah. I knew for a fact that I was not going to go to this place called heaven. And I knew, I had heard enough about hell, that I knew I was going to hell. Mm -hmm. All I know, I didn't say nothing. I didn't say the sinner's prayer. I didn't ask Jesus into my heart. I'm not against that. I didn't say the Hail Mary. I didn't say my act of contrition. None of that left. All I know is I started to, I started to blurt this out to the priest. I just started weeping like a baby, like a little baby. I started weeping. I started confessing my sin. I started saying everything I knew, what I knew, that I was seeing, that I was seeing. And actually, the word conviction, it actually, if you look it up in the Greek, it actually means to cause you to see something you really you've never seen before. And that's what God did. He caused me to see sin the way I'd never seen it before. Amen. All I know is I walked into that room, not saying one thing to the priest. I walked out of that room and I was born again. Because I realized within that day, I had, now the drugs, I had no drugs over there. 
I had lost a desire for drinking beer, tequilas. I had lost all desire for drinking within that moment. All gone after 16 years. And the biggest thing to me, and this is what we'll get, I, don't, I lost all desire for fornication. That was my big one. That was the one, if you're going to take, take them all, but don't take that one away, Lord. But anyhow, I lost all desire to fornicate, and I lost all desire for self-gratification. All of it. And it's been like that ever since. I never lost a desire for women, because if I did, there'd be something wrong with me. But I lost all desire for sexual immorality. Amen. So I walked out of there, and my language totally changed. I mean, I was F-U-C-K, left, right, and center. I mean, with the construction, all that. I mean, it all, I got totally, I never just got saved. I got sozoed. Yes. And sozo is a lot more than just being saved from hell. It's being delivered. I got delivered. Yes. Now, so this caused some problems with my cousins. Because, um, what happened to you? Well, I went to the confession, whatever, I don't know. But all I know is I wanted to move back home. And that really caused a lot of problems because they just built the, 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 the image back again with me and the, with the music and all that. It caused some serious problems. But I knew what I didn't know what had happened to me. I didn't, nobody told me I was born again. But all I know is I wanted to go back to school. And after, I was totally addicted to music too. I loved music. I was getting really good at it. And for, God started to change my desires right away. And a lot of people still in the church today, they got a problem with that. Well, that's their problem. Because you know what? God gave me so, such a desire for missionary work now. And they say, well, you could have used your music. I said, shut up. Let God be God in my life. I have no desire for music whatsoever. You know? And uh, so anyhow, I ended up moving back to school. Uh, moved back home. Moved back to my parents, actually. Been out of the house for eight years before that. Ten years. I moved out when I was 20. I got kicked out when I was 21. And I was 31 years old when I got born again. So um, I wanted to go back to school. So I started looking, maybe possible Bible school, stuff like that. I got into the whole health thing because I had some, some issues with my health because of the drugs and all that. But it wasn't for, for a couple of months or I guess a couple of years, I think, God began to give me a real desire for studying. And I thought I was going to go to Bible school. So I went to Hungary with some pastors from King Street Pentecostal Church. And God really began to open some things up to me about the tra traveling missionary work and stuff like that. And uh, so I came back home and um, I started studying. I started spending all, I got rid of all my, my equipment, everything. I got rid of it all. It was so easy. I couldn't believe it. The grace was just so much in there. And uh, so what happened is I started studying. I started buying, I started spending all my money on books. I've got probably about 6,000 books in my library now, and I'm still buying books. Um, I started studying church history, started studying Greek and Hebrew. Nobody teaching me this stuff. I had no pastor coming. I'm not trying to knock anybody down, but nobody came along to help me with this. It was all God. And one of the things, I got three minutes left. I can't believe it went that fast. And uh, all I know is that one of the things that God got on me, Right from the beginning, I remember I was walking down the hallway, and I was going into my room, and my mom's room was there, and her door was open about eight, ten inches, and I heard her on her bed, it was during the day, and she was speaking in these funny languages, and I, at least I had enough sense in me to say, whatever that is, at least I said, I want that, and I didn't say, I didn't want that. I said, I want that. And within two days, I got my baptism in my room, Amen. speaking in tongues. Long story short, God began to deal with me about praying in tongues every day. So much that he told me, I don't want you to listen to music on your way to work. And I was working downtown Toronto a lot of time. I don't want you to listen to no music, no worship music. He says, I want you to pray in tongues. And I want you to pray in tongues as much as you can at work. I want you to sing in tongues. And I want you to pray in tongues on the way back home from work. So I did that for years. And God began, I didn't know at the time, but God began to try to teach me things. And because my soul was so messed up, that's where you get into this unbelief and wavering and all this stuff and wrong indoctrination you pick up in the church and wrong books I was reading and stuff like that. God was trying to get truth over to me. And I was writing a lot of this stuff down, though. I'm a writer. 
and we're, I'm working on some books right now. I have visions. Uh, God's given me dreams and visions concerning writing books for, for the church and stuff like that. So I began to write this stuff down, but my soul wasn't picking it up. I, I just wasn't receiving it. But I kept on praying in tongues. And uh, what happened is that God began to move on me to, to pass out tracts at work, give out Bibles at work, get some shirts made, to strike up conversations with the guys. Uh, it's a great way to break the ice. Guys will come up to me, and I had one of the shirts. One of my favorite shirts was uh, porn. Uh, how did it say again? It said porn. Oh, how did it go again? How could I? I had so many shirts. <laughs> All I know is it says porn sends you to hell. At the back. So that got a lot of guys coming up to me. Hey, we don't like their shirt and stuff like that. So that opened up the conversation to the gospel. Yeah. You know, oh, so, porn serves one purpose. One of the guys said, well, per, there's, por there's purpose to porn. I said, yeah, it sends you to hell. <laughs> really, it doesn't. You, you know, it really doesn't, but in a way it does. But so that was one, one of my first shirts. And I started making a lot of shirts. I started, was able to really witness that work. And God began to deal with me about passing out tracks in Oshawa to the place where I was passing out tracks three times a week. And uh, doing a whole streets at a time. Eventually I got some people, some women. I couldn't find guys. Didn't hit guys. Uh, I couldn't find any guys to come out with me. I, God just supernaturally got older women, younger women. And to help me pass out tracks in Oshawa. And long story short here. Um, I had, um, in 2002, this is the year before, I'm just being honest here. This is the year before I quit going to church. Because I am not a pew sitter. I'm actually out to set people free from sitting in the pews. Because I don't see pew sitting in the Bible at all. And we've got way too much pew sitting in the church today. All I know is in 2002, God spoke to me at work one day. And he said, my word demands your full attention. He spoke that, that to me three times within five seconds. I didn't know what he meant. I was already in the word. I was studying a lot of church history. So that, that was the problem right there. Not that he didn't want me to study church history. But I was more into that than in the word. So I kind of put it off, and then, that was in 2002, 2003, I just left the church after, I don't know how many churches, I went to eight different Catholic churches after I got saved, and I just wasn't doing it for me. I went to Baptist church, that wasn't doing it for me. I went to Pentecostal church for two years, that wasn't bad, but I had some friends there, they left for a word of faith church in Ajax, so I went with them, and all they did was, they, they talked about faith, but all they talked about was money. And I was, I had a real heart for evangelism. So I left that church. And I'm skipping a lot of stuff here. God was confirming all of my church hopping. He really was. And then I left that church. I went back to Pentecostal church. I left that a couple months after that. I went to a non-denominational church. And I became a pew sitter again. But the whole time God had me doing tracks. And God was preparing me for something. I didn't know what it was. But I knew it was something big. You know. So I left. And I started using all my time to seek God. All of it. When my parents left the house for church, I'll tell you, you hear prayer, prayer seeking out God. You know, screaming out to God in the basement so loud that I don't want my neighbors to hear me. I went to the basement. 2004 was a big year for me also. I had a visitation. And this is two years after I left the church. I thought God was mad at me. People were saying, you know, you're backslid. I said, if I'm backslid, how much more are you backslid? And you go to church, you know. I got nothing against going to church, trust me. But we are the church. Yes. We don't go to church, we are the church, for crying out loud. All I know is 2004, I get this visitation in my room. It started at 1 a.m. in the morning, it lasted until 5, 4.55 a.m. I woke up four, night, four times during that night, worked all week, it was a Saturday morning. I was used to going to bed at... 8 o'clock Friday nights after working 40 hours of putting up drywall. If anybody knows ever put up drywall. And I mean we're talking about 14 footers, 12 footers, 5 eighths fire rated drywall. Okay? On scissor lifts and stuff like that. Alright? And God had me going to bed at 8 o'clock at night Friday so I can get up at 4 o'clock Saturday to go walk the pavements. And to walk the parks, praying in tongues, seeking His face. Okay? So anyhow, I get this visitation. And all I know is I woke up three times. The fourth time I woke up, and all over my chest were these words, missionary enterprises. And I remember when I woke up, and it was just all, it was almost like it was trying to burst out of my, 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 my guts. 
You know, and I realized every time I had woken up during that night, the same night, those were the words I was hearing inside of me. Missionary enterprise. Missionary. So I knew God wasn't mad at me. I knew God was not mad at me for leaving the church. So long story short, I'm sure I'm... I'm just give me a couple more minutes here. All right. <laughs> because this, this is the best part, I think, anyhow. For me it was, but it isn't. So... 2004. I didn't know much about faith. I basically threw out the whole faith message out with the, ba the baby with the bathwater. How stupid can you get? You know, I had such a, a desire for missionary work. I had such a desire for evangelism. And I, was, I wasn't being equipped for it in the church I was going. I was hardly hearing anything about it. You know, that's why I left. I didn't leave. I left for the right reasons. And I don't, I don't teach that to encourage people to leave the church. Because you can't leave the church because you're the church if you're born again. But I don't encourage people to leave a, a local fellowship. I really don't. But that's what happened to me. And after I left, I started reading all these testimonies on TV, reading books about people having left the church to go after God. I said, well, I'm not the only one then. I actually I heard a, a, a Derry. His, name is, his last name is Derry. He started the, um, the Dream Center out, out west. And now he's in Vancouver. And he was a pastor, PAOC pastor, for years. And God pulled him out of the church for four years to start getting rid of the, some of the traditions that he had picked up. Uh, some of the wrong theology, wrong doctrine and stuff like that. So all I know is uh, 2004 I get this visit, this huge visitation which totally transformed my life. Now before that I was already reading books on John Wesley. Huge, I got a huge section, Reformation, Reformers. I mean, missionary movements. William Booth is one of my heroes. I mean, I was just filling myself up with this more than the Word. And it, 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 you know, it's done a lot to me. But all I know is God was trying to get me into His Word more than anything else. So after I got that visitation, I didn't know what to do really with it. I didn't know nothing about confessing God's Word. I didn't know nothing about faith. So in 2007, so I went through three years there, a really major warfare. I didn't know much about warfare. I hardly knew anything about what the Bible's said about warfare, that's how stupid I was, and that's how stupid you can become. If you're, if you're going to go after God, this is what God gave me a couple years ago, the closer you go after God, you are, st I heard this, and this is wrong, that everything just, you got God's protection and all that, and things are going to get easier. You know what? Things get harder. I'll tell you, God told me one day, He says, you, the closer you get to me in my perfect will, you just stepped into a war zone. I said, oh, thank you for telling me that now. Well, he tried to tell me that before. But it's not what I was hearing from the church overall. You know? So I was going through a lot of stuff at home, a lot of stuff with, with leaders that knew me and stuff like that. And the mind games, the mind games for crying out loud. I didn't know nothing about mind renewal. I didn't know nothing about putting on the helmet of the salvation, which is mind renewal. I didn't know none of this stuff. That Paul said we not we, we should not be ignorant of his devices. I was totally ignorant of his devices, you know. And that's what God was trying to get over to me in 2002 when He said, "My word demands your full attention." Mm -hmm. So finally, in 2007, He got my full attention. Um, I had gotten hit in my body because of doing the tracks spiritually. I mean, it affected me physically to the place where I couldn't do couldn't do tracks anymore. Uh, the doctors started talking about uh, amputating my legs, stuff like that. It got so bad. If they couldn't do anything with the operation, stuff like that. God began to show me about divine healing, things like that, which I did not believe in. You know, I was not a cessationist or anything like that, but I just didn't believe in the way I should believe. And all I know is God began the first word, the two first words that God gave me in uh, 2007, January. The first word was faith puts God to work. That was the first word I got. And then right after that, I got faith opens doors. So, it was so strong. I still remember, I just woke up. And as soon as I got off my bed, God gave me those two words. So, I got a rampage on, on learning all I could learn about faith. Because I need to see God working in my life. I had not put... I walked by sight. Basically. I walked by sight for 13 years. I'm being transparent. And I know a lot of Christians walk by sight. Yet, they think they walk by faith. They are walking by sight because just the way they're talking. Yes. I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They should know better because they listen to all the, the, the faith preachers. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, 
God began to teach me on faith like I had never heard faith before. And the reason why he was, te he was able to teach me on faith the way he was is because I had given most of my time to praying in tongues. That, that's something that we're still to the day. Uh, Pastor Doug Schneider from Embassy, I know him a little bit. He had said a few years ago, he says the Pentecostal churches are moving away from the importance of praying in tongues. Well, no kidding. Most charismatics don't even pray in tongues. They have the gift of tongues, but they don't use the tongues. Yeah. Because in the Bible it says, he who prays in tongues edifies himself, speaks to God, all that. But in the Greek it says, he who habitually, habitually, it's in the present tense, he who continually prays in tongues. Two years, I think 2009, the Lord said, I want to hear two things coming out of your mouth. My word and tongues. That's what he told me. That's right. That's what he told me. Now, he already had the tongues thing going, but he didn't have the word thing going. Mm -hmm. And this is where God began to teach me about faith. This is where God began to teach me about confessing God's word, saying the same thing, homologio. God began to teach me about sowing the word. God began to open up the parables of the sower, which leads me into this whole place of being transformed into his image. I'm skipping a lot of stuff. I'm touching a lot of things, but I only... I got a platform here, I'm going to make the most of it, and I'm winding down. All I know is God began to teach me also, not only about faith and walking by faith and not by sight, and God began to teach me about my sonship, which is something we almost hardly hear about still to this day. We hear a little bit about it, but we should be hearing it everywhere. The minute you put on Christian TV, you should be hearing about your sonship, because that's who we are in Christ. We are sons of God. I'm not a churchgoer. I'm not a Baptist. I'm not a Pentecostal. I'm not a charismatic. I'm not a word of faith guy. I am a son of God. Jesus in his humanity is actually my elder brother. Because he's the firstborn. So I don't know where I am in the line. But I'm something born down the road. The building of born whatever. God began to show me all these things. And it totally, totally revolutionized not only my walk with God, I, I should say my walk with Jesus as my elder brother. Yes, he's my Lord, he's my head and all that. I kind of had that figured out already. He's the boss, but he's my elder brother. But it also changed my whole relationship with God, my father, because in John 20, 17, he said, go tell my brother, this is after the, the, the resurrection, he said, go tell my brother, I go back to my God, their, your God, my Father, your Father. That's in his humanity. Yeah. That started to change everything for me. Everything. Even when it comes to provision. I don't want to get into that today. But all I know is that eventually, when I get into this, skip a lot of things, eventually, I got the revelation, I was taking a shower one day, take showers more than one day, but anyhow, <laughs> one day I was in the shower, and God had, had been teaching me a lot of the powers of the sower, sowing the word, sowing the word, that's part of your building, your faith, you know, we've got to measure faith, but you know, it's the word that builds faith in the area where you have no faith in the soul, God began to show me the difference between the recreated spirit, which is the very same nature that Jesus had in his humanity, where the Holy Spirit dwells in, but then God began to show me this other part of me, my soul, which is your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect. And that's the part of me that needs to be transformed into his image. That's the part of me that needs to be renewed. Actually, the word renewed means to be reversed. Literally, reversed. So I realized that's where all the strongholds are. All the wrong images. All the wrong strongholds of wrong believing, wrong thinking, wrong indoctrination. All that kind of stuff is all in the soul. So, God brought into my life uh, two great men out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, out of all places. Dave Robeson and Gary Carpenter. These guys talk about unbelief and pulling down strongholds and fasting. God got me on fasting in 2008. I've been fasting ever since. I lost like almost 30, 35 pounds since then. You know, but out of all that, skipping a lot of things, out of all that, God opened up a huge door for Mission Enterprise last year. He sent me I, I did seven different nations in less than a month. And uh, I preached mostly in uh, the Congo, all in French. Here's a guy, no credentials, none of that. And my, I did my first conference out there in front of all pastors. And I had pastors coming up to me 
And some of these guys were directors of Bible schools. And I made contacts. And this is all God's doing. I got nothing to do with this. I, I had to prepare myself for it. And I also had to believe him for it too. That's something else God really put it hard on me. He says, Pierre, God again began to give me dreams. I brought them all down. I got them in my journal. It's all going to be on my website, all that. God began to give me dreams of a missionary prize, what God wants to do, equipping the saints, starting a Bible school, uh, concerning Osh, uh, Canada being a nation that's going to train and send missionaries, which was prophesied by Young Cho years ago. God began all that, bring that to me. But he said, you need to believe me. You need to believe me for this. Yeah. If you don't believe it, I can't do it. That's how much emphasis God puts on faith. And I'll tell you, I've been studying a lot about faith in the last years, especially since 2007, and I'm still in areas, I'm still dealing with unbelief. You know? So all I know is God opened up this door uh, for me to go to Africa, keep in contact, I'm planning on going back, hopefully this year, but uh, the Lord told me, you know, He says, let me take care of that, you just keep doing what I'm doing. God opened up a door with the full gospel here with Doug, and um, all I know is that in the next, you know, a testimony is usually it has two parts at least. It's what God has done, what God is doing. Everybody should have a second part to their testimony. You know, and I feel sorry for a lot of people because they don't they just don't have God working in their lives because they, they haven't learned how to put God to work in their lives. And I want to touch on this here, and then that's it. I need to touch on this because this whole thing about here. Uh, to be like Jesus, all I ask is to be like Him. You know, we already are like Him once we're born again. We already are in our spirit. It's the soul, I mean, in His humanity. Now, you know, the Bible says we're born of incorruptible seed. The Bible says we're partakers of a new, new uh, divine nature. The Bible says we're a new creation. You know, all these different terms. You know, how many times that Paul refers to being in Christ, in union with Christ? Who is Christ? Christ, Paul refers to Christ, many things, but as the last Adam. So God began to show me that I'm part of a new race. Because he's the last Adam, he's the second Adam. You know, and that's, I want to go back to the garden thing. I was in the shower, and um, you know, God, I've been spending a lot of time in the parables and stuff like that, studying faith. And one of the things that God showed me about sowing the word... Because the Bible says in Luke 8, 11, the Bible says the seed is the word of God. So, God showed me one day, he said to me, he says, If farmers did with their seeds, with my, what my children do with my word, we'd be all starving to death today. I'll tell you, that, that motivated me so much that I started getting little digital recorders, and I started putting the word on there with my own voice, whole epistles, promises God had given me, verses on who I am in Christ, verses on prosperity, and we're talking about this before, you know, got the headphones, while praying in tongues. That's what I do. Most of my time, that's all I do. I, I'm, I got the word on, and I'm praying in tongues, speaking in tongues under my breath. You know? So, one of the things that God showed me in the shower that day, that I was actually back into the garden. I just saw it. Don't explain to me how he did it. You know, you guys know how it is when God shows you something that's supernatural. But God showed me that I was back, actually, not geographically, but I was actually back in the garden. Also, I see that the second, you know, I'm, the, I'm at the right hand of the Father, but I'm actually back in the garden, which really opened up things a lot to me, a lot of things to me, because God told me one day, He says, if you want to find out my perfect will for you here as a son, and it says in Luke 3.38, says that Adam was the son of God. He was considered a son, created in God's image. We are creating God's image in our spirit, but we've got to get that, we got to transfer that image into our soul. You know, that's why it says to be transformed into his image. Not in my spirit, in my soul. Because I already have his image in my spirit. And then God began to show me his perfect will for me as son, but for the church. Go back to the garden. So we got these guys out there teaching today, won't mention names. Even in our Pentecostal churches, that God uses sickness. God uses poverty to humble you, to teach you things. And that is nowhere near back in the garden. And that began to set me free from so many things that I've heard over the years. You know, I'm, it's, I, I, I don't want to be malicious. I don't want to slander anybody. You know, we have a lot of well-intended people in the church, but they're ignorant about truth. Because why? Not because God is keeping it from them. It's all in here. And if they would take their tongues, 
sit down somewhere, find a park like I do, and like a lot of other people do, start speaking out those mysteries, God, the Holy Spirit, who resides right on the inside of us. I made a lot about that in Africa. You know, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, who's come to also represent the second Adam because he's called another comforter of the same kind. And right there in John 14, 26, he says, Jesus said, he will come in my name, in my place, to act on my behalf. And he dwells on the inside of me. So I've got the greatest teacher in the world living on the inside of me. And so do you if you're born again. Thank you very much. We're not supposed to get sick as Christians, as, as, as sons of God. Because God, Jesus already, like the brother said, Jesus already bore it. He became our substitute. You mentioned that last month, you know, which is a huge teaching that I've got concerning our substitution. But back in the garden, go back in the garden. There was no healing. There was no disease. There was no poverty. There was no sin. And even when I teach on sinlessness, people say, who do you think you are? Jesus. In spirit I am. And the more I transform into his image, I can get rid of more sin. Because it's not part of the believer's life because I'm in union with the sinless one for crying out loud. That's right. You know? Amen. So, I'll tell you, I'm excited. Praise for the God. church. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've been criticized a lot of things about the church, being hard on the church, but God showed me something just last week. He says, you're not against the church, Pierre. You're against the condition of the church. Yes. Yes. And that really changed my perspective because I don't, I don't hate the church. How can I hate the church? It's his body. They're my brothers and sisters. It's God's sons. You know, no gender to the word son in the Greek. But I got a real problem with its condition. Because the world is going to hell because of its condition. And there's no reason for the world to go to hell because Jesus already paid the price for them to go to hell. For not to go to hell. You know? Nobody's going to hell for sin because he already bore their sin. They're going for the sin of unbelief because they don't believe. That's right. John 16, 8, 9. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin. The sin of unbelief. The sin's already been dealt with. You know? But it's time for the church to become the church. And I just, I got to share this. I'm on my bike a couple years ago. I remember where I was. God spoke to me. He says, you are transforming to what you're saying. Whoa! I've been speaking God's word since 2007. Before that, I was speaking my circumstances. I was coming in agreement with all my circumstances. Until he showed me, he says, circumstances must become irrelevant. You will know when you're in faith, when you're, when you're no longer moved by what you see. I said, oh my goodness, I've got a long way to go here because I'm moved by everything what I see or don't see or feel. You know? But he spoke that to me on my bike that day. He says, you're transforming to what you're saying. That encourages so much to say God's word because the more I speak it, the more it gets inside of me. The Word. Who's the Word? Christ. Amen. That's where He's being formed inside of us. Yeah. So praise God. It's, that's good news. Yeah. Amen. We got good news. Amen. Most preachers got bad news. Amen. I want to hear the good news. Amen.